Hello! Welcome back to the Southern Bible Thumper channel where we equip ourselves with the Holy Book so that we can effectively square up with Satan. <laughs> For this upload, we will be reading Numbers chapter 25. Before I get started, I would like to just give some more information. I did mention that I don't go to church regularly or I've been streaming services. I don't go to physical church. I will honor the Sabbath by making sure I don't have to work on those days, reading the Bible, communing with nature, and, you know, using streaming services to attend church. I have had three really good incidents that, that I want to share. The first incident, I was dealing with housing insecurity and employment insecurity. I went to the church for help. The pastor and his wife seemed uninterested, but there was a white man in the audience uh, who was a church member who overheard, you know, what I was asking for prayer for. And he walked up to me and gave me $50. I really needed it. And it went to food. The second incident that I had was when I moved to where I live now. Now I live about three hours away from my hometown. And this church was called Judah. The man and his wife welcomed me. They were so warm to me and my family. And I had a really good experience with that. Uh, the reason why I didn't go back to the first church was because I moved and it's like three hours away. The reason why I quit going to this Judah church was because I moved again. So it's the better part of 45 minutes to get to that church. And I just would rather conserve my resources. Lastly, I went to a different church and um, I, I would rather not give the name of the church, but they welcomed me warmly. And this church, what was special about it, it was all white. And all three of these times were white people, uh, white pastors leading. But with this church, it was me and one other black woman who didn't speak English that well. And the pastor of that church made me feel so welcome. And he even offered to uh, bring me a Bible because I didn't bring my Bible that day. He offered to bring me a Bible if I came back. And then um, he invited me to a function that they were having later on that week, which I went to. And everyone there from the congregation just welcomed me. The reason why I didn't go back to that church was because, well, it was just a bit dry compared to what I'm used to. I grew up Southern Baptist and I'm used to you know, gospel music, up-tempo, and praise dancing, shouting. So going to a church where they don't have that, and I'm also used to a certain style of preaching. Some Southern pastors still have it. Uh, and what I mean by that is like B.H. Uh, McClendenin. Like, that's one of my favorite pastors. I also listen to Keith Moore. But it's just like I that Southern rhythmic type of preaching like that's what i like to listen to and be a part of but the reason why this is important is because christians and other people we love to point out when the church doesn't do the right thing but there are churches that do the right thing and i have experienced being embraced at church i have experienced being welcomed and it was the onus was on me why I didn't return. It wasn't that I was treated badly every time. Now this last ministry, <laughs> uh, I, and what makes it so weird about this? Well, let me just not say that. Part of why I am not as consistent as I would like to be is because I know I want to reduce bias as much as possible and reduce injecting my personality but sometimes I feel like it just runs over. I feel like I have the sun living inside of me. It just wants to burst out. But I just really wanted to say that because it's so easy to just remind 
you know, point out, oh, the church, the church sucks. Like you know, most people have something negative to say about church. And I really, really, really want to make a point to point out when there are positive experiences. And so that's that. Uh, let's go ahead and start reading. Numbers chapter 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and bought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses, and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel, who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, hath turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, but I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he shall have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood, because he was zealous for his God, and made an atonement for the children of Israel. Now the name of the Israelite that was slain, even that was slain with the Midianitish woman, was Zimri, the son of Salu, a prince of a chief house among the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianitish woman that was slain was Cosby, the daughter of Zer. He was head over a people and of a chief house in Midian. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Vex the Midianites and smite them, for they vex you with their wiles, wherewith they have beguiled you in the matter of Peor. And in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of a prince of Midian, their sister, which was slain in the day of the plague for Peor's sake. So now we are going to summarize chapter 25. I prefer to use Bible Ref because uh, you can click on each verse. So Israel begins to participate in idol worship with the daughters of Moab. This makes God angry. In verse 4, God says to Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord in the sun, so that the fierce anger of the Lord will be turned from Israel. Verse 5, Moses tells judges, he tells the judges of, in Israel, so these are uh, like you would have judges now. Moses tells these judges, after God tells him this, to kill all who have participated. Verses 6 through 8. An Israelite named Zimri bought a Midianitish non-Israelite woman named Cosby to the tabernacle. In front of a weeping audience who was already present at the tabernacle, Phineas, who is Aaron's grandson, stabbed the male Zimri and the woman Cosby through the stomach with a javelin in front of the audience at the tabernacle. So we stabbed someone or stabbed two people at church in front of an audience. And then verse eight says, so, or it'll say thus in some translations, the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. 24,000 people died from the plague. Verse 10, God tells Moses that he will give Phinehas a covenant of peace and an everlasting priesthood because of his zeal or his passion for God. God recognizes this action by Phinehas as an atonement for Israel. In verses 14 and 15, the Bible tells us the details of the two slain people. 
And in verses 16 through 18, God tells Moses to smite the Midianites because they have deceived Israel. And this is why that woman, Cosby, was stabbed. Highlights. In chapter 22, in Numbers chapter 22, the king of Moab was worried about the Israelites and sought to curse them. He even enlisted the help of another king. But by chapter 25, the people had deceived Israel and lured them away from God. So instead of worshiping the God of Israel, they're now worshiping this other God and participating in what God calls whoredom. And some of these translations say they were committing, uh, you know, having sexual relations with the these women. Then we have the incident of Phineas. So in verse six, verse six through 12, Phineas, who is Aaron's grandson, stabs these two people. And so when God talks about it, he mentions this and he says, you know, so he turned my anger away from them. You know, he turned my anger away from Israel. But then in verse 12, he gives Phineas a covenant of peace. So reading this, again, Phineas stabs two people in church in front of people who are already there for some other reason, and it says they were weeping. So zealous and jealous are... Because when we look at some of these, we'll see jealousy... King James Version does say zealous. And when you look up the word jealousy, you do see the word zealous as one of the definitions. And what it's just saying is zealous is like eagerness. You look up at synonyms, you know, energetic, uh, fervent, ardent, enthusiastic. So what God is saying here is, you know, so he was quite enthusiastic. He was quite passionate. And I recognize that he was trying to do a good thing, but, you know, he needs the gift of peace for me. So there's that. Then the other thing that I, was, that I thought was very interesting, verses four and five, how God communicates what he wants done to Moses and then how Moses translates it to the Israelites. God tells Moses this, you know, he says it to him sort of in a dramatic way, you know, take, take the chiefs and hang their heads in the sun before the Lord. And then Moses just takes that and he goes, hey, judges, uh, kill all the people who have engaged in immorality. So I thought that was something to pay attention to. And the other thing or the, the last highlight that I would like to mention is God's anger. And God, uh, how God refers to his own anger. We look here in verse four. And God says to Moses, take the leaders. So he's telling Moses, complete this action before the Lord, so that the Lord's anger will turn away from Israel. See these, these quotes right here? This is God talking. Plus, it says before that, the Lord says to Moses. So God is telling Moses, hey, Moses, complete this action before the Lord so that you will turn the Lord's anger away from you. That is a strange way to communicate something about the self. Why would you refer to yourself like that if you're talking? And it just keeps reinforcing this detail that I've noticed so far, God is never manifested as an entity or a gender or a physical being that we can understand. 
God is also limited to language when it comes to how we perceive him. So that's also going to lead to some discrepancy on what God is and how we can describe him. We look at verse 8 also, and we see the same type of pattern. The plague was stopped. It was verse 11. I'm sorry. The plague was stopped in the way God even says this, I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. It, it just, it just makes me wonder if this is something that maybe when God is displeased because he's hundred percent creation, when he's displeased, it just goes out of him because the way this is worded is it's just worded in a way that there's more there. Okay. And I'm just going to go through some of the other ways that God has manifested himself. In Genesis chapter one, God manifests through voice and through creation. That's how he manifests, or that's how evidence, that's how the physical world manifests and shows evidence that God is there. It's through voice and through creation instead of his physical being. We look at Genesis chapter nine, God manifests through a rainbow. Then we look at uh, Exodus chapter 14, God manifests by dividing the Red Sea. He manifests himself in Exodus chapter 16 through manna or through providing food. Exodus chapter 33, God shows Moses his back parts. In Exodus chapter 19, he manifests through thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud. These are somewhat nicer ways that he's manifested. But when we look at some of these other ways, we look at Genesis chapter six with the flood. And it states, the Bible states that the world was corrupt and God was sorrowful to have created man. The difference with Genesis chapter six, God sort of planned this and he tells Noah, he gives Noah updates on this is what you need to do to, to prepare for the flood. So this this emotion that God says, or God's state of being, this is what happened was a flood. Also Numbers chapter 22, with King Balaam and the talking donkey, God's anger was kindled in that chapter, but he sent an angel, even though he was angry, he sent an angel that inconvenienced Balaam this seems more controlled, but when we look at like Numbers chapter 21 with the fiery serpents, God became angry and fiery serpents came. We look at number 16, the earth opened up to consume those 250 men. We look at verse 35 in Numbers chapter 16 and, and verse 46 in Numbers chapter 16, fire and wrath came from the Lord. And it's, it sounds like a reaction. We look at Leviticus chapter 10, Aaron's sons offer strange fire and there went out fire from the Lord. And God is manifested through 100% power, through 100% energy. So we know that God is not human. And I just wanted to, uh, point out again that when God even discusses his anger, it's not the way a human would discuss anger. So I wanted to make that point. And then lastly, verses 16 through 18, God tells Moses, hey, these people that deceived you, strike them down. Vex them. God wants Israel to eliminate these people. So the same group was terrified of Israel just two chapters ago. So for them to have completely deceived Israel away from God, 
It is quite the feat. Well, I appreciate you watching this video and the next upload will be Numbers 27. Thank you for watching.